So I want to talk a little more about some of this Pure Land diversity. Like before we talk about the Pure Land movement in Japan, I want to talk about some of the the philosophical and doctrinal threads that kind of uh, begin in China, right? So the kind of, you know, the transmission of Buddhism from India to China, then from China to Korea and Japan, um, uh, that then go on to inform uh, the development of this Pure Land movement within medieval Japan. Um, so here I'm talking about the Pure Land and the Lotus School. Um, the Lotus School we associate with the, the monk Jur-e of the Tiantai Mountains, and then the lineage that formed around him called the Tiantai School. Tiantai in Chinese becomes Chonte in Korean, becomes Tendai in Japan. Um, the, the Tiantai tradition in China and the Tendai movement in Japan are both closely associated with the Pure Land uh, practice and Pure Land movements in those respective countries. Um, the, the great scholar monk Jur E uh, was one of the first to uh, successfully systematize the diversity of Buddhism as it was transmitted from South Asia into East Asia. Remember, Buddhism did not come into China as one thing or at one time. So the diversity of the hundreds of Buddhist texts was sometimes difficult to understand. You know, how does it all fit together? Well, Jur E developed a comprehensive doctrinal system and a comprehensive meditation system. One of the one one component of his meditation system was a ninety day period of meditation. Um, uh during which you may contemplate the buddha amitabha right so you know sitting contemplating the image of amitabha walking contemplating the image of amitabha and so on um and through this process you may end up having a vision of the buddha amitabha or reach a state of heightened awareness where you see that the pure land over here and this world over here are actually one and the same right uh, the, the enlightened buddha over here and the foolish being over here are one and the same through this rigorous form of meditation you can have this realization uh here and now um and, and as i as i said some of the most important pure land theorists um practiced in the you know that practiced in this lineage right and then you know a, a, another important aspect of this is that is a connection to uh to, to the lotus sutra um uh, the devotion to the lotus sutra and devotion to the Pure Land often worked hand in hand. Um, and in later Japanese Tendai, at least, um, it, it's often said that you do Lotus practice in the morning and then Pure Land practice in the evening. And that's how you structure uh, your day. Um, so this is one important thread in, you know, in this you know, East Asian Pure Land uh, tapestry. We also have um, the you know, encyclopedic Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, the Avatamsaka Sutra is, is an early Mahayana Sutra that in English translation is like, I don't know, 1700 pages or something like that. It's, it's very, very big. It's a huge sutra. Um, and again, it assumes this Mahayana cosmology with, you know, in, you know, with limitless Buddhas in limitless directions. Um, but there's, you know, in that diversity, there's also kind of, kind of a holistic understanding, right? So uh, this world is actually interconnected with all of the other worlds. Uh, one being is interconnected with all other beings. Therefore, right, you know, Buddha far away and beings here, not so far away after all, but actually interconnected, interpenetrating, right? Um, so we have the, the interpenetration, the, the interconnection of all Buddha lands uh, and the mind and the pure land are, you know, again, kind of, uh, you know, interconnected. Um, it's sometimes said that the, uh, um, the Avatamsaka Sutra um, uh, was, was in some ways the inspiration for what we might think of as, uh, uh, or, you know, we greatly informed uh, the Tiantai tradition, the, the, the Chan or Zen tradition, as well as the esoteric traditions as well. Uh, and uh, it's actually, uh, so, so you know, Shinran, the founder of, of Jodo Shinshu, uh, quotes the Avatamsaka Sutra extensively. And the final passage of Shinran's Kyogyo Shinsho includes a quote from the Avatamsaka Sutra. So I think the fact that Shinran gave the Avatamsaka Sutra the last word in his great compendium can't be an accident, right? So we can think about the, the importance of the Avatamsaka Sutra that lays out the full Bodhisattva path in you know, 52 stages or something. And, you know, the infinite worlds and, you know, uh, the interconnection of all things. Um, and then we can associate that with a simple practice, right? So this idea that even a simple practice can't like saying the name of a Buddha can encompass 
you know, this Bodhisattva path that is supposed to take three incalculable eons through the, the Buddha realms of the ten directions, maybe all of that can be compressed and experienced right here, right now, in some way. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the Pure Lands appear, there are an assumed component of the Tantras as well. Now, the Tantras are ritual manuals that are very important in most forms of South Asian religion. Um, we associate the Tantras with Vajrayana uh, in, in uh, Tibet and East Asia, as well as the so-called esoteric Buddhism of, of, the, es of the East Asian tradition. Um, the Tantras are closely associated with the Dharani, which are kind of like long mantras and then you know, mantra texts that are you know, specifically about the practice of mantras. Uh, and there are many Dharani and mantra texts that promote rebirth in the Pure Land of Amitabha, coursing through the, the Pure Lands of the Ten Directions, and in some case, you know, in an instant, right? You can achieve rebirth in the Pure Land and Buddhahood in this very body at the same time. Um, in some texts, it's even said that the attainment of rebirth in the Pure Land and the attainment of, you know, um, Buddhahood in this very body are actually the same event, just viewed from two different perspectives. Right. From my perspective as an ordinary Sindhian being, I see the Buddha far away coming to uh, you know, aid in my awakening from the Buddha's perspective. However, that that is one and the same, right? Because Buddhas and ordinary beings are not separate. They are one and the same. Ordinary reality and enlightened reality are not two separate things. They are one and the same. And, and we see this uh, enacted through the, the esoteric rituals um, of these texts as well. Next, we have the, uh, the the Chan or Zen tradition. Uh, so Chan in China, Son in Korea, Zen in Japan. Um, a while back, I was sitting with one of my teachers who uh, used to be a Korean monk uh, in, in in the Chan tradition, or, or sorry, uh, in the Son tradition in Korea. And he told me that his teacher back in Korea sent him a present. Guess what the present was? It was a scroll with the name of Amitabha on it. Right. Um, people often talk about the syncretism of Pure Land and Chan, but I think that's a little problematic because that presumes that Pure Land and Chan are two separate things. Right. Um, scholar Robert Sharp has written a great article on that um, because indeed Chan Buddhism as a distinct form of Buddhism within you know the, the East Asian sphere um, emerged from the Mahayana tradition, and if Pure Land is already a component a dimension, an aspect of Mahayana Buddhism, you know, and if Chan is a form of Mahayana Buddhism, then again, you know, we can see how this cosmology works within the Chan context. We can see some Chan literature that emphasizes the, uh, the interconnectedness uh, of Chan and Pure Land, um, <clears throat> perhaps, you know, borrowing from, from the Abhatamska uh, Sutra perspective. Um, but, you know, so we can, and, and there's even a, a practice within later Chan um, Nian Fulja Shushe, um, which means who is it that chants the name of Amitabha, right? So that's a really interesting practice. So that you, you know, through this this you know practice, you you come to understand that it's not I calling a Buddha far away to come save me, but rather that Buddha far away is in fact an aspect of my own mind right here right now. Um, <clears throat> many of the most revered patriarchs of the Chan tradition were also pure, uh, purely an aspirants. Uh, many of the first Chan specialists uh, ha had a background in Pure Land meditation. Uh, and Chan Buddhism today uh, is largely characterized or, or often characterized by uh, Pure Land oriented practices, right? Um, so these two are, uh, you know, these two, Pure Land and Chan, are not necessarily regarded as uh, two separate things. And uh, the, the monk here uh, depicted uh, uh, Yong Ming Yen Shou. A very important uh, Zen master and scholar of the Avatamska Sutra. Um, he is, uh, it's often said, you know, whether or not he said this is a different matter, but it's often said that he, that he declared that, you know, if you practice, you know, if you practice Zen alone, you know, one out of a hundred will be successful. If you practice pure land alone, you know, everybody will be successful. If you do them both, you're like a tiger with horns which I guess means super effective at something. I don't know, I just love that idea of a, of a tiger with horns. Um, so Pure Land and Chan, again, often work together um, quite well. 
purely um, as, as the uh, scholar Giorgio Halkius has demonstrated, uh, Pure Land was also a very important component of, of Tibetan Buddhism. In the same way that we see Pure Land within the Tantras, and the Tantras are front and center and very important in Tibetan Buddhism, we can see kind of the way that, that this, uh, you know, the various practices develop around this Buddha and around this Pure Land. Poa practice is a form of kind of deathbed contemplation that you might practice in your lifetime where you practice shooting your consciousness from your head to the Pure Land. Um, so the Dalai Lama uh, engages in this practice and in a, in a local uh, Tibetan Sangha uh, near Albany also uh, um, I've seen engages in pra these practices. Um, we, we have tankas and mandalas and other things depicting the Buddha Amitabha and the popular mantra Om Mani Padme Hom that we uh, uh, often associate with Tibetan Buddhism um, dedicated to the Bodhisattva of Compassion Avalokiteshvara one of the um, uh, um, you know one of the benefits of practicing this mantra is possible rebirth in the Pure Land of the Buddha Amitabha. So uh, we can also see that within the, 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 the Tibetan sphere, um, Pure Land remains important as well. All right. Now I want to switch and talk uh, about the monk Honen and the Pure Land movement. Um, early Japanese Buddhism, um, you know, kind of received all of these different threads. So Tendai, Zen, esoteric Buddhism, uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra, and so on. So um, what monks were often in, you know, uh, so in early Japanese Buddhism, monks are often um, employed by the government to chant Dalini texts and chant sutras uh, for the long life of the emperor, uh, to bless the realm and the kingdom, and so on. From the ninth century, with the transmission of Tendai and, and, and Shingon schools, we see a, a, a strong emphasis on the esoteric path, uh, esoteric rituals again you know monks are employed by the government to uh, perform these rituals to kind of you know uh, keep things running smoothly okay um, in uh, the 1100s uh, a monk named Honen um, who had been practicing in the Tendai tradition had studied broadly in the various uh, lineages of his day um, Honen perhaps had something like a crisis of faith and uh, was looking for the the essential tradition, like the the the, the, the fundamental tradition um, that would work for all people. Um, this way of thinking goes something like this, perhaps that um, if the Buddha is compassion, right? It, it, if compassion and altruism are fundamental to the Mahayana path, then what practice is the best expression of the Buddha's compassion? A form of practice that requires extensive education, four PhDs, and a lot of money from the kings and emperors, or a form of practice that anybody can do, right? Honen ultimately decided that the best form of practice must be a form of practice that all beings can practice. And for him, that was the recitation of the name of the Buddha Amitabha, Namo Amida Butsu. So in his vast knowledge, you know, supposedly reading the entire Buddhist canon three times, um, I imagine reading several bookshelves of books, through, you know, several times. Um, Honen decided that the Pure Land path was the most effective path for the world of his day, which a world that was in chaos, uh, uh, as he saw. Right. So we see. Um, so Honen declares that he will this kind of area of focus on the Pure Land or Pure Land Shu. Now the word Shu often means sect or school today, but um, perhaps for Honen and his early movement, it was seen as a, as a way of kind of focusing, right? Kind of break down the whole system establish a pure land foundation and then kind of build things back up upon that foundation, you could say. Um, uh, the early pure land school is largely populated by Tendai monks, so other monks that were practicing, uh, the, you know, in the pure land lit tradition li like Honen. In particular, he emphasized the exclusive reliance on the other power of the Buddha Amita. So in other words, enlightenment is not something that I achieve on my own, but rather something that the Buddha Amitabha is, is, is guiding me uh, to. Um, there were some critics, but some of those critics um, came to see Honen as, as a great, as a great uh, bodhisattva, even. Um, one, of, uh, one of the critics of Honen said that, uh, you know, after seeing him debate, he had a dream where Honen was standing by a gate, uh, you know, uh, feeding people. Right. So we understood that, that what Honen was doing was, uh, you know, you know, had it had its role. 
and and for a time Honin was successful. Um, you know, uh, you know, unlike many uh, you know founders, um, Honin did not languish in obscurity. He was popular among aristocrats, even the emperor. Um, but um, eventually, his movement was persecuted, and he was sent into exile. Now, during Honin. Um, one of Honin's more obscure students who ended up becoming the, you know, regarded as the founder of the largest school of Japanese Buddhism is this monk Shinran. Now, probably in the future, we'll do, uh, do a lecture where we just focus on Shinran, but um, Shinran was part of the, the part of this community that is then sent into exile. Um, Shinran also had something like a um, crisis of faith that, uh, you know, after spending 20 years on the mountain, uh, Mount Hiei, practicing and practicing. He was not making progress and uh, decided that perhaps for some people, these practices maybe um, make you more egotistical instead of breaking down the ego. So he goes to seek, you know, a, a path that will be more effective for him uh, and joins Honin's group. Um, in exile, um, uh, Shinran and the rest are, are stripped of their status as monk. So Shinran declares himself neither monk nor layman. Um, Shinran's view of the Nembutsu, I think, is really is important and a little different than than others. Like, whereas for many other uh, proponents of the Pure Line practices, like it's like I engage with the Buddha Amitabha, then Amitabha comes and helps me, right? Um, but for for um, you know, so like you say the Nembutsu to kind of call the Buddha, right? But for Shinran, um, the Nembutsu doesn't really do anything. Right? The Nembutsu doesn't cause the Buddha to come help you because indeed the Buddha is working through you. It, it, even your ability to say Namo Amida Butsu is an act of compassion coming from this Buddha reality. Right? Um, so the Nembutsu then becomes not an act that I do, not a form of practice, but a great practice that is beyond self and other, beyond this dichotomy of Buddha and, and self. Um, so that the practice of reciting the name is an act of entrusting, entrusting that um, I'm, you know, not on this path alone, but rather part of you know, this this broader flow. Okay. In addition to Shinran, I also want to talk about the monk Eshini, you know, and and want to recommend this book by James Dobbins, uh, Letters of the Nun Eshini. Um, without Eshini, I think probably uh, Shinran would have languished in obscurity. Uh, and not have become the great uh, founder that we know him uh, as now. Um, Eshini was Shinran's wife and an important member of his early community that helped uh, fund his uh, mission. Yeah. Um, uh, the letters of Eshini uh, contribute greatly to our knowledge about what the early uh, Shin community was like, uh, what Shinran was like as a person. Um, uh, and even in modern Japan, there were debates like, was Shinran even a real person? Like, you know, how do we really know that? So, as, you know, people were kind of thinking about religion and, and history and what do we really know? Uh, you know, there's some doubt about that. But these letters that were discovered kind of shed a lot of light on that. Um, Eshin Shinran's daughter, Kakushinni, um, built the first mausoleum dedicated to her founder, which eventually, for, eventually emerged as a center of devotion, right? So then rather than Shin Buddhism just being some amorphous movement kind of related to Shinran. With Kakushini, we have a, a center of practice around the around the mausoleum of Shinran. And this is uh, it actually influenced other schools of Japanese Buddhism as well. Um, within, uh, within the letters of Eshini, something that I think is really important is that we see uh, a, a, a Buddhist woman talking about gender as something that is not an obstacle. Now, one of the things that was so radical about Shin Buddhism is that um, it kind of, the priest is not very important, right? It's you and the Buddha, right? Um, uh, but because the previous uh, regime had kind of said, um, you know, uh, women are in need of salvation. You need to rely on the priests for your salvation. But if it's just you and the Buddha, you as you are, are embraced, right? So one's marital status, being a monk or a nun or a lay person, uh, being an aristocrat, being a commoner, being man or woman, in a sense, none of that matters, right? Because you as you are, right, and, you know, uh, are, are embraced by uh, Buddha reality, Buddhist, com the compassion of the Buddha, right? Um, and then, so after their example, uh, Jodo Shinshu temples were often run by married couples, uh, rather than having 
temples as armed fortresses later in the medieval period you have you know dojo places for the practice of the way where ordinary people would gather to share in the dharma um, so with that i will conclude my the formal portion of my talk stop sharing my screen and if there are any questions or thoughts or reflections